Hello and welcome to our fourth installment of the Field Stories. Um, we're very happy to be here today with Ingrid Ramon Parra, um, who is a PhD candidate in cultural anthropology. Um, in addition to finishing her PhD, uh, she's also a, um, a freelance research consultant and a career advisor for PhD students who are looking to transition out of academia into the public and the private sector. Um, she's currently working on an independent book um, project titled The Transition Out of Academia Manual, Contemporary strategies for the modern job market um, and uh, that is set to publish in spring of 2021 so we're very excited about that um, in addition to her fieldwork in the Brazilian Amazon with the Kayapo peoples uh, her interests also include critical design cooking tiny homes I love that one and South American music so um, Ingrid thank you so much for being here with us uh, we really appreciate uh, this uh, your willingness to have this conversation um, I will give a little bit of background. Um, Ingrid is a writer who has written about fieldwork and fieldwork experiences, um, and a link to that writing will be made, ex made available below. Um, but first, um, what I want to ask is, Ingrid, how did you get into writing about fieldwork and specifically the experiences of people who identify as women in the field? Um, what got you started in feeling like, you know, you're going to start writing a blog about it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thanks. Thanks for that introduction, Jerrica. Um, I, I think as a graduate student, there's a lot of, especially as a PhD student, there's a lot of anxiety over writing um, because you feel that everything has to be cited perfectly, needs to be peer reviewed. You feel like you need to hop a lot of hoops in order to be able to have anything written with your name on it. And so I had felt that dread of anxiety like everybody else, but I am somewhat of a writer by nature. I, I love casual writing and casual reading and I don't think anything published necessarily needs to be entirely perfect um, and I believe that writing for the public sector is extremely important so I'm not um, only looking to do a kind of academic publishing I want my writing to be very accessible um, and so I decided to start off with something very safe uh, I wrote an article on medium which is a really great self-publishing platform with not many barriers to publishing. So it's a, somewhat of a democratizing kind of a website. So I like that a lot. Um, so I started writing an article just about the things that I took to my field work. So what's in my field bag? Mm -hmm. um, it's very safe, non-controversial type of article. Um, and it got me really thinking about practice and how practice is very important to me. And throughout my uh, PhD since I'm a first generation student I always I think I, I often felt like I didn't know what field work was really like or being an anthropologist was really like and I had a lot of questions that I felt were maybe dumb or I was embarrassed to ask that were just about the practice of being an anthropologist. Right. Um, and I think that led me into my second article which is the one about gender and field research um, which I wrote just I think I wrote it more for me than anything else to kind of document some of the things I learned after I came back from my field work in the Amazon um, and so it it kind of the inspiration for it was talking to a couple of friends that I trusted about their field work experiences and being able to tell them like hey can I ask you this question it may be TMI and you don't have to answer it but can I ask you this and so I got that kind of like intimate reciprocity regarding field work that I really, really needed. And I touched upon some of those things and others in that second article, um, which I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from. And it just let me know that I was somewhat, somewhat on the right track of wanting to have these conversations that I couldn't find in many places. So candidly and openly and casually, um, and that other people were wondering and thinking about the same things that I was. Yeah. Um, and that maybe if that, those conversations were had prior to field work, there may be more positive field work experiences or at least a way to mitigate anything negative you encounter when you're in the field. Um, so that's how I got started on that topic. I think uh, field researcher subjectivity is so fascinating in our field and field work of course is a hallmark experience for us as anthropologists so i love the idea of us talking about it a lot more right, um, right. but i know there are a lot of barriers to that kind of honesty so um it's unfortunate but that was my kind of attempt to talk about some of those things in a way 
Yeah, absolutely. And so for, you know, as we'll have it linked below, but included in that article was very real conversations about um, practical, you know, doing field work, you know, in a woman's body, what yeah. that looks like um, with, you know, men menstruation or how would you, you know, hygiene, different things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and these aren't conversations, but I really wanted to kind of touch on what you said about this idea that there's really no one to ask, despite the fact that we're surrounded by specialists and um, professors and advisors, that real sort of um, idea that fieldwork is this time when you go out on your own and you, um, you find out those answers for yourself. And um, that is really kind of tradition that we want to change. We, we want students to have, aware, be, have an awareness, but also that imposter syndrome when you are a first generation mm -hmm. student like both of us. And when you are just in general kind of, um, it's the, you know, I know, never knew anyone who had a, did a PhD or who did fieldwork. And um, I, I recall this very same questions like how much should I be writing and then when you ask that it almost feels like an exposure of your um, that what will people think that I don't know that already and I'm already in a PhD and it's, it's so much anxiety and fear and we just want to talk about these things and have these conversations um, because um, yeah we don't know what we know until we're learned or even people who teach us at one point didn't know but why are we hiding these things why is it not something that we can talk about so yeah that's that's really wonderful I'm so glad that you um, you know came out and had you know had something that people can consult. Um, what has been, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your field work. It was in the a Brazilian Amazon. Um, and um, just in general, what that field, like was, field work was like. Yeah, uh, my field work experience was really, uh, I would say just so life enriching and it almost feels like a once in a lifetime type of experience for me. And so I think of my field work very fondly, but very emotionally. And what I mean by that is that there is just the whole gamut of emotions that one can feel I experienced in my field work. Um, so my field work in some way feels more like the classic notion of field work, where you go to a different country with a group of people that speak a totally different language, not even a romantic language, right? but just uh, an entire a language from like entirely different language family. Um, there were indigenous people um, and my field site happened to be very remote. And so I had that experience of not having a phone or internet access or even uh, reliable electricity, which is more aligned with the classic and romantic and problematic notions of field work. It's not, and so that was my field site itself. Um, but my topic was actually very contemporary because it was about digital media appropriation. And so that, that was the kind of two seemingly kind of contra contradictory things where it's you have uh, an environment with not a lot of infrastructure where you're trying to carry out a project that needs a lot of digital infrastructure. And that was part of the amazing challenge I had that I really loved. I, it was uh, fantastic and amazing to do that there. Um, but again, field work is, is an, it's, you're submitting your body to an experience. And many times you can't, you can't take a break because you're, you're, you're there somewhere. Um, so my experience was that I actually left my field site every three months. So I couldn't necessarily leave my field site because it was so remote difficult to get into and to somewhat leave. And so I was really there for three months chunks for total about 14 months. And I would leave every three months uh, only to go get food and supplies or to go and uh, visit a museum archive and then I would return. So uh, in that sense, my field work feels very kind of classical, old school, Margaret Mead type of vibes. Um, but I know that field work takes many forms nowadays and you have digital ethnographies, multi-sided research, and um, people are doing research in cities. And so, but mine was that, that, that was the kind of um, site that I was fortunate to, to be able to do research in. Yeah, it's really, I'm so glad we're having this conversation because we often talk about problematic field work as far as um, all the things that go wrong. And so it is nice to hear of, a ref of that because field work is transformative. It, it can be a wonderful experience um, and wanting it to meet, you know, um, 
make that more of a common occurrence, but it's great to hear that of, of these fond memories you have, despite the fact that, of course, at the same time, it is difficult, right? It is fieldwork okay. by nature is hard. Um, and you mentioned, you mentioned this as well, the stories you heard from others while doing fieldwork, especially women, if stories of sexual assault, stories of sexual harassment, um, and these things kind of being kept silent or under wraps. Mm -hmm. And so this is why, um, despite, you know, um, all of the wonderful things of fieldwork, we, we, you even nod to this in your writing. And um, this is something that we've even been told at Fieldwork Initiative. We're worried that if we talk about this, we're going to dissuade students from doing fieldwork. And so I really like that in this conversation, we're able to talk about fieldwork and all of its glory and the whole running the gauntlet of everything it entails, good, bad, and the ugly, and otherwise, um, just so uh, folks have like a toolkit of knowing what, what to encounter. Um, what was some of the responses folks reached out to you, I imagine, after writing this? Because it was some, such a rare um, thing to just have these conversations. Um, what were some of the responses maybe that you got um, from uh, releasing this piece? Yeah, I got so I've I've gotten only positive feedback for for the pieces that I've written, but th this piece in particular has gone farther uh, in terms of reach. I get uh, plenty. I mean, I'm not gonna say my inbox is you know full of messages, but I have gotten plenty of messages, especially on LinkedIn, from people who found my article and then just kind of googled me and then sent me a connect and then we talked. And a lot of them are from from young women. They're from young women who are like, hey, thanks for writing this. I'm getting prepared. And I was reading articles and this one was super helpful. And I just felt compelled to say thank you. So I've gotten a lot of that. Like, thank you for writing that. I'm preparing for the field. I'm getting excited. And I'm, you know, reading your article and seeing things that I haven't read in other articles. So I've gotten a lot of positive reviews. And now that I kind of look back, I remember when I initially wrote that piece, um, I felt that it was too long, which is odd because now I look back and I think, wow, it was so short because everything that I talk about there, I could just expand on and thinking now that maybe there's a young woman um, who's thinking about going into research and reading my article, it makes me wish that I had said more because it would be better, right? Better received or there may be more to take from it. Um, but nonetheless, I've gotten a lot of positive um, feedback from both articles with that one in particular, people reaching out to me. So I was, I feel like it's one of the pieces of writing that I've done that has reached the public more than anything that I've done in the past. Yeah, which speaks to kind of how, um, how inaccessible this information is, such as like men menstruating while in the field, or um, how do you, you know, have high, you know, just a very realistic things, machismo in the field as well. You talk about this, you talk about in general, um, just kind of a very realistic look of the things to know and be aware of um, as, instead of this idea that we have to go and find these things out for ourselves that might involve trauma or that might involve um, things that might dissuade people from, you know, abandoning their field or just not being well prepared. Mm -hmm. um, did yeah. you feel per particularly that you had a good amount of support in your field work or that you, um, did you have, you know, did you feel that there was enough precautions or safety and you know in general whatever it might have looked like that students um, maybe in your own case or others did get enough uh, information they needed to stay safe or just to stay um, you know and we say safe of course we're talking about physically but also just our, our mental health and that imposter syndrome and all those mm -hmm. things you spoke about like why didn't I know any of this before I mean why you were the one to write about it first so um, we're just just curious about what kind of pre preparation you might have been given or had Mm -hmm. I would say that in terms of field work, I was lucky because I went to my site twice prior to my long extended stay. Um, and so I learned a little bit by trial and error. So the first time I went, I brought certain clothing and certain things and I saw what worked and what didn't work because my site was so remote. And so I had a little bit of like a rehearsal, very short rehearsal, um, but nothing could prepare you <laughs> for the long stretch. It, it's it's just entirely different. Um, so I had that. I had a lot of academic preparation. Uh, my advisor is an expert in, in this site and in this topic. And so I felt very academically prepared. Now, in terms of some of those other topics um, that are more uncomfortable to talk about, that was not really brought up. And I would say in graduate education in general, I think there are maybe mandatory sexual harassment trainings that you have as a student um, and maybe as a TA, but 
that doesn't extend into the field work itself. And I think there's a lot of expectations that your advisor is going to prepare you um, unofficially, under the table, off the record about certain things. But I have a strong suspicion that that doesn't happen because I've talked to different people. And people doesn't, like, oh, it doesn't happen. I'll the same you. thing. They were just like, oh, I just came to find it myself. So I wish it was something that was brought up a lot more, but because the advisor and advisee relationship has to be so professional, I can see why it would be hard to have these conversations because you don't want to break that kind of professional barrier and ask something very intimate or, very, or be very vulnerable in front of your advisor. Um, so it's, I think it says more of the culture of academia and of field work and of anthropology than it does about anything else. It's, you know, it, there are spoken things that need to be said explicitly, but the culture makes it so it doesn't happen or, or mm -hmm. that it's unlikely to happen. So I was prepared in some respects. I could have been way more prepared, I think. And with those other topics, I, I think I could have been even more prepared too, right? There could have been more explicit training, I think, for yeah. people. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, it's, um, you've said so many important things. I'm like, yes, yes. <laughs> Just because the training is, is left. Um, we really very rarely, very rarely see training. And one of the, mostly the only thing that, I mean, it summed up in one sentence, if people show concerns that what about, you know, sexual harassment or what about gendered violence? And, and, um, usually folks are told like, well, wear a wedding ring, um, which we know doesn't work and it's bad advice. But something that you wrote about, which I thought um, is very important, is the perception of sexuality in the field. For example, you were perceived as an American woman, as a heterosexual American woman. And I was thinking about how problematic even this idea of wearing a wedding ring um, means for a, maybe somebody who might identify as queer or LGBTQIA and that they have to do this performative um, heteronormativity in order to be safe in areas where, um, you know, there's um, sort of a different levels of, um, of violence against folks or under acceptance, whatever we might say. Um, and so um, th these are the kinds of important conversations to have, but you're very right that this feels too racy for some um, advisors or some people to feel that it's an intimate topic that's not appropriate. And so despite the fact that we know it's so sorely needed, which um, is why we're having this conversation now, I, it lends itself to this. Um, you also talk about nationality in the field in, in general and the perceptions about how local um, folks or in general, how people receive this idea of a researcher coming in their nationality. Mm -hmm. um, and I, something that I definitely resonated with was at times this uncomfortable over-enthusiasm people might have for Americans and what that might mean if you, um, you know, just in general, that, that if um, people have an idea about who you are um, mm -hmm. and how to kind of navigate that if it, doesn't, if it doesn't speak to your own personal identity. Um, you, you wrote that people oftentimes might first assume that you were Brazilian and then they mm -hmm. um, kind of realized you were American and it was a little uncomfortable when they were overly praising America and the United States mm -hmm. because it didn't quite align with, you know, um, with, with, your, with your feelings and, mm -hmm. and that is uncomfortable. Yes, yeah, I think, you know, when you're, I think one of the reasons why certain topics aren't brought up is because sometimes I think as a field, we might be in denial that these things are happening or we, we feel that maybe, like you said, it might dissuade students or it might, it's almost like bringing the harsh reality about field work removes some of the romanticization of it, mm -hmm. which is problematic. And on the other hand, another problematic attitude that I've experienced is that field work is somewhat of a rite of passage. It's almost like a hazing thing where like I was thrown into the field and I figured it out and that's just part of the experience. I completely disagree with that. And I also think it's problematic because the point of field work is not, the point of field work is to go and try to do good work under the good principles of anthropology. It's not to go and have a negative experience so that you can come out of it and feel like an anthropologist. That to me, that's not what it is. But I've, I've seen those attitudes be there um, and just this denial that uh, field work can be negative. Not only can it be dangerous, 
as we've seen throughout history with anthropologists passing in the field, but it can be downright negative and toxic and you encounter all different kinds of people, people you expect and people you don't expect. And you have to figure out how to act with every single one of them. And when you're in a, whatever region you're in or as you're traveling, you're being read a certain way. And it's all of those intersections kind of are read differently. So like I mentioned, yeah, I was read as Brazilian. Um, and I am in fact from South America, not from Brazil. Um, but that meant that on the positive side, maybe certain negative things that might happen to a kind of Germanic looking American might not happen to me. But on the other side is that I might be read as a local person. And so I'll be vulnerable to local forms of racism, sexism, or being read a certain way. And that's also that, right? So it, it is, I think, even another layer of fieldwork is like, what is it like to do fieldwork as a woman of color? That's a whole other layer. And sexuality as well, like if you're read as queer, what does that mean in a place where it's not safe for people to be open about their sexuality? Right. But the, that needs to be said because there are actual dangers in the field you know you are there usually by yourself and you may or may not have immediate contact with anybody back home or university or whatever it may be so you are submitting yourself you submit your body to field work uh, and that means many things and that's why preparation is so incredibly important and i think as a field we've somewhat failed with we're good about other things, but not about acknowledging the fact that we need to be prepared to go out into the field emotionally and physically. And that's missing. Yeah, sure. absolutely. And the, there's a large amount of gatekeeping in that, in the sense that um, when we make these critiques about field work, it's very, uh, it's seen as very sort of dangerous um, and very sort of, um, people are very quick to run to protect these standards and these traditions of field work. And um, what we often heard or what we often might encounter is if you do say this is dangerous or uncomfortable, just as you alluded to, you might get the response, um, well, this is field work. If you can't handle it, you know, if, you, if it's, you know, too hot, then get out of the kitchen. And this idea that this is what field work is. But of course, we know, as you spoke, it's very plural and the risks are different for different people. Um, and your sense, because both of us worked in very rural areas, um, so being just speaking very practically did you have access to at any moment you could call someone um did you have access to sort of were you in the range of um of reaching out to folks because oftentimes we see people are completely off the grid and are very much what you said submitted their body to field work and all the risks that it might entail mm -hmm. um and um you know what advice do we give when people are going to these super rural areas i don't know if that was your case for super yes. rural but nonetheless like when they are completely unplugged from all all forms of um, SOS or whatnot and, and what that experience might be like, if, if you can speak to that, or just in general, the, that kind of added la layer of, of danger. Oh, I can definitely speak to that. Yeah, I was in an area, I wouldn't say it was off the grid entirely, but I would say mostly, mostly off the grid, because if something happened, so the only kind of way to communicate outside of the village for, you know, in my uh, fieldwork experience was to use one of those um, kind of like ham type radios mm -hmm. where you connect and you kind of call out and you hope that and you connect to a channel and you hope that someone somewhere kind of picks it up, which is a somewhat reliable way of getting a hold of the outside. But there are so many chains. You, the message has to travel through a lot of different people to get to someone important. Um, so for example, if something happened late at night, um, and let's say, just for example, that I needed immediate medical attention, it would be very hard for anyone late at night to be able to pick up that radio and then go and then call, you know, whoever needs to be called and then to fly in in the small Cessna plane to pick somebody up. It's, it's not made for immediate emergencies. It's very hard for that. Now, if I needed to send out a message, it would take a while to reach the recipient that I needed. So there were times that I actually did send messages out and I actually had to handwrite them. Someone would take a letter and then fly it over to the nearest city and then someone would do me a favor and take a picture and email it to the person. So there's just so many steps 
and it takes a lot of time that if something really dangerous happened or if something happened that you want immediate input on, you're not going to get that. It's going to take a while. And so if anything happened to me there, it would take a while. And actually I did have one thing that actually happened um, that I, that was somewhat dangerous when I was in the field and I ended up leaving about a week after um, because I had, I had an accident where a battery, I was using solar where one of the batteries that I had connected to my solar kit um, was overcharged and it kind of blew up and I had um, um, some damage to my eye, to one of my eyes. And I was really concerned about it and I couldn't, there was no running water when it happened. So I had to go and wash in the river, you know, having had this experience that was really kind of physically traumatic for me. Um, and then not being able to leave right away to go get my eye checked out. And then I finally did and everything was fine. Um, and that generated a conversation, which was great about solar safety. And so then we created a manual for any future researchers that would come in so that wouldn't happen to them because that was super unpleasant, you know? And so that was an example of something that happened to me that I felt very personally affected by, um, but didn't have the immediate uh, way to kind of get out. And it was something that I somewhat understood before going in that that was gonna happen, but could I have been better prepared or could I have had maybe a plan of action or something? Yeah, I could have, and I didn't have that you know i didn't have that so yeah when you are in those rural or even really deep into certain country parts immediacy is somewhat thrown out the window which makes it even more imperative for there to be some kind of a plan in case something happens you know medically or crushingly emotionally yeah. like there are things that like rape that can happen in the field mm -hmm. and you need attention and quickly and how do you do that if your field site is so remote? Right, right, absolutely. Um, I was thinking of that yeah. medical, yeah, in general, but I noticed this is part of a larger trend of you encountering things that had not been spoken about and then writing about them so that it, it lets folks know. Because I'm imagining, um, yeah, first of all, just the risks that you speak of, of, you know, by nature, the field work risks, then the added layer of the remote and the location, and then the added layer of delay of not having immediacy. I mean, that those adding up and, and, and then on the extra added layer of no training and no yeah. um, information, you know, this is just, you're kind of thrown in. Right. And this is the, almost the, the traditions of fieldwork. We know often field workers were working in colonial spaces that they had, this, they sort of yielded a lot of power as like cis white men of children of the elites. And that this has transferred over even till now we see this sort of idea of proving yourself and, and what that risk might have to entail if you do so. Um, and also um, you spoke about the emotional toll and I'm thinking in general, what we see and what, you know, many of us have experienced um, is this idea that people at home kind of see these risks and are worried, people who love us, our friends and family, um, and that that often is what keeps people from not telling is because they don't want to, um, they think, oh, you know, my friends or my mom is already worried about me, and so I can't tell them realistically what's going on and what the risks are, let alone, I mean, it sounds like you even had difficulty connecting with people, yeah. um, but that, that, um, that fear of kind of I told you so or that fear of retaliation in the event that we do have to leave spaces or they do get too dangerous that that not only serves that that's a burden that the individual researcher has to have but it also serves this idea that you couldn't handle anthropological field work or field work in general then there's that kind of added bl victim blaming and we very rarely critique the field work standard right it, it, it yeah. still remains intact despite um, despite when we see things go wrong yes, yes. and that's so true about um, even feeling, even kind of gaslighting yourself when something goes wrong because you don't want your family who was worried about you to be like, see, that was a dangerous experience. Like, you know, you don't want to appear like um, something that you were so excited about and worked so hard for is also dangerous and disappointing and very emotional. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, again, it's like, it's a, cultural thing i think because if we often if we normalize these conversations they would be expected when we go into the field we would be better prepared even if there are things that are not going to change right like if you're in a rural area you're not going to be able to remove the 
uh, or add immediacy to emergency. You just can't. But you can have some kind of a plan in case something happens. And if it doesn't, you thought it through and it made you feel psychologically better. And if it does, you go through the plan. Right? So yeah, there's, there are things that can be prepared for. And there are things that you can't. Now, those things that we can prepare for, those are things we're not even talking about. So how are we even going to address any part of the, the unexpected in the field work when things that are normal or things that happen to a lot of people, we can't even talk about? It leaves you really kind of psychologically unsafe. And I think you don't do, regardless of where your field work is, role or not, you're going to have emotions about it. Because you are somewhere else usually, or you encounter people you don't expect to encounter. Even having access to your favorite snacks. Just things you're so used to that make you feel like you and it's your life. You may not have access to in the field. Your favorite tea, your favorite, th you know, just things that are very small. Your favorite tea mug. Like something that feels so mine and part of my experience. My, I may not be able to take it there. And so you start feeling a little bit out of your element. It's easy, so easy to feel very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Even in research that is urban and you have access to your family and access to electricity and the internet, you can mm -hmm. still feel that, let alone when you don't have those things, right? So if we have these conversations, it will help any researcher, even if they are in more connected contemporary urban sites you're still meeting new people, maybe speaking a new language, maybe not. You're still seen as a researcher. You're still being read certain ways. You're still experiencing emotional dimensions of the field work and the experience. And you're going through the motions just the same as someone who is completely off the grid in the other part of the world. Yeah. Yeah. Even you spoke, um, we spoke about this before, but just, um, the idea of linguistic loneliness and that that's a real thing that when you're somewhere and you cannot have um even you know even if you've learned local languages you're always talking through a filter you know you're always there's always the essence of translation and that this can be very lonely a feeling like no one really knows who you really are um but you you are working on a project about transitioning i mean we're talking about wanting to see transitions and changes in academia um, yeah. and in anthropology our own field although this conversation is far reaching to many fields i feel just in general um and so maybe we can you can speak a little bit about that i know we have to wait till spring of 2021 to read the book but in general that that if people find that this is that um this is very problematic and that if their career is going to involve a lot of problematic field work but they still want to be in the field or they still want to do work in this domain or they still want to apply those skills and um, that transitioning it sounds like you have a great mm -hmm. deal of um of knowledge to um impart onto someone who might be in that position and it, it, that seems to be what's going to be featured in your upcoming book. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, knowledge and opinions, honestly. Um, <laughs> Don't think, we all? Yeah, right. Uh, another thing of our field that I think we're in denial about, I think academia at large is in denial about the number of graduates that are needing positions and the number of academic positions available, at least nationally. I'm just going to stick to the U.S. for, for this uh, combo. Um, so we're in denial about the fact that not everyone who gets a PhD is going to find a tenure track position. And the, all of the stats point to that, point to a very extremely competitive job market of very prepared people. So we know that. Mm -hmm. um, and yet I feel that, one, that isn't being acknowledged, right? Mm -hmm. um, which I think is... It's own, I don't know, I, I think it's, it's really unfortunate and really sad to not be able to acknowledge that that's the case because what are you doing to your graduates? You, they're succeeding, doing great work, but then they aren't finding any positions. And especially if you are from a marginalized community, mm -hmm. you are even less likely to find anything. And when you look at the statistics, it's a competitive job market, people of color, have the hardest time even finding part-time contract type positions at community colleges. They usually have the, the, the path to tenure is long and arduous, but if you are a vulnerable person, it's even more so 
-hmm. And that is extremely sad. And I think it's part of anthropology kind of becoming self-reflective. I see it happening a little bit more, but it needs to be more explicit based upon the statistics and the trends. Um, so that's that. Secondly, there's some departments that look down on applied and practicing anthropology as not real anthropology. And that's also problematic because if you've been in a PhD program for a long time and all of a sudden you realize that, you know what, I'm actually not going to pursue academia, there is an emotional um, response to that decision because you've been told for so long that tenure track is a dream, being an anthropologist and having multiple field seasons and multiple books about your field site is the goal. Mm -hmm. And now you're actually letting go of that. That's emotional. But when there's that layer of stigma that you didn't make it as an anthropologist because you didn't get an academic position, mm -hmm. it just puts all of the current graduates at such a disadvantage, at an emotional and professional disadvantage at the age of their life maybe mid, late, or even in early 30s, you know, that, that, that part of your life where it's so imperative for your career and your future to succeed professionally. Because as you're continuing to get older, you're at that stage of your life where it's so important. So it's, it's really sad to me to see that. And I experienced part of that because I was fortunate that my department um, hired uh, an applied anthropologist. Um, and so I had that bit of an avenue to have that discussion and say, you know what, I don't actually want to seek a tenure track. I actually want to seek, uh, be a practicing or apply anthropologist elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And I still really stand by that decision and mm -hmm. my interest in having this conversation and writing that book is supporting others who may find themselves in the position that I was in where they decided it wasn't for them or others who've been on the job market three to five years and haven't lied at anything and they've decided to kind of pivot course in their career. And so that's why I decided to write this book. Another reason why is because a lot of the advice that I was getting, I found to be very outdated advice. Things that maybe have worked 10 or 15 years ago to transition, they don't work today. The job market is, is ever changing, especially with you know, a lot of the ways in which technology has affected the job application process and the hiring process. So we need contemporary modern ways of supporting students mm -hmm. in getting into different fields. So not only do you have to translate your academic uh, goals into something practical, but you have to do it with current modern strategies of the job market. And I found that I learned those through trial and error. And there was a growing pain for me, a huge growing pain for me that I fortunately came out uh, well in the end, but I feel like sharing some of those strategies and tips that I use will help people. It's still going to be a growing pain to transfer, but it will be a more prepared, just like feel you'll be more prepared for that process because it's a process in of itself. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm interested in it. I think applied and practicing anthropology is amazing. I think anthropologists are equipped to be in so many different job positions and in job markets because a lot of the work that we do is about understanding people and how things figure into the lives of people and that's what every other job so many other positions want right they have a, a product that they want to understand mm -hmm. that they want to sell and you can help with that so anthropology is actually extremely marketable but we are not helped or trained in making ourselves marketable mm -hmm. And when we do have some advice, it's often very outdated. And you're not going to be competitive with those types of advice and when you haven't translated your skills. There, there is a way in which to do things. And so I decided to start writing this book with the lessons that I learned and with the understanding that this book in five or 10 years won't be as useful because there will be new strategies or other things to take into consideration. Um, and I feel that also needs to be said and acknowledged so people can be better prepared. So anthros can go out in the world and succeed in the way that I know they can. Yeah. But they need that. I think that extra support. Yeah, absolutely. I think even a lot of what you just said speaks to that 
um, the way in which our the culture is to serve those traditions and the f real fear people have about standing up to the status quo mm -hmm. um, on top of just I mean that being in and of itself but on top of knowing that there are limited positions and there's limited space for folks to stay and stick around this is often why we see people are afraid to say something because they worry they're going to be persona non grata in this already limited and in um, you know, exclusive club of, um, you know, people who are plugged in. Um, and then they're going to be out of the good graces of this passion they have, or this thing that they have their, you know, they've done field work in, or they've done all of their career gearing towards it. And then what then that they have to kind of accept it in all of its faults or else, um, they're going to be out of a job or out of a career or out of, you know, whatever it might be. Right. Um, so yeah, this is very, very important um, to have a conversation about the practical, you know, aspects of it. And if you do feel like fieldwork wasn't for you, or that if this just you, you know, for whatever reason, you find that you want to do something else, that, that it's not game over, that there's a lot of degrees of, um, of accessible, you know, points of entry into other things that are incredibly necessary and needed. Mm -hmm. um, so this is great. I guess we have to hear more. We'll look forward to more um, in your book. Well, Ingrid, thank you so much for this conversation. It's very illuminating. Um, any maybe final thoughts? And then we want to direct folks to your, your writing and your, um, your, where they can contact you. Yeah, I guess um, prior to our conversation, something I had thought about was what, how can, because part, a lot of the work that I do is um, I think through the creation of things that are helpful to people. Mm -hmm. So for me, I want to be helpful. I don't want to be those people that are um, creating things that don't help anybody. That's just my personal um, kind of stance on what I spend my time on. And so writing and kind of right now I'm sketching through the content of that manual. Um, I, that's my primary thing. It's like, how do I help empower or equip people to do it themselves? And so something that I've been thinking is back to the topic of field work is like, how do we empower students to prepare mm -hmm. themselves when maybe their department isn't ready to prepare them? Right. Right. And so I've been thinking through and I'm like, oh, should I make, because I love making little things. I was like, should I make a little booklet or like anything that helps people think through writing a plan or think through um, what field work might be like, the emotional aspect, like, is there something that I can create and just send out there and have students kind of fill out and think through as they prepare for their field work? Because I don't think it's going to happen from the departments. Mm -hmm. And so I, that's something that I've been thinking about is how can we empower each other mm -hmm. uh, in the absence of support from the department or in the absence of formal support for these types of topics? Because sexual harassment, very real in the field. Meeting toxic people, very real in the field. Um, real in real life, but also in the field, you do come across problematic people. You come across people who see you in a certain way um, that maybe you don't see yourself or they see you as a means to an end to something even you can't offer. And so even having that emotional preparation right. is incredibly important. And so I wonder what can we do to empower ourselves? And I know having these conversations is a huge way. Um, and I think it needs to be pushed more. Mm -hmm. and even though I think the burden is on the departments to do it, I don't think it's going to happen. So I think students, it's a, I think a problem to think about solutions for is how do we empower ourselves to be better prepared in our field? And the answer is, I don't know, but I love thinking through what I can do to create something that will help people think through that mm -hmm. in their own research. So yeah, um, I think that's an ongoing conversation that needs to be had, but Right. Um, I'd love to hear ideas about it. Yeah, absolutely. This is so important. We even, you know, at Phil, the Fieldwork Initiative has trainings where we try to go in and have these conversations. And very awesome. often, um, it's only, it's very often we get shut down from departments that say, oh, that's not necessary, or we have our own training and we know that there is no training. I mean, students have come to us because there's no training. Right. And so there is so much difficulty with permeating through that protect, that sort of gatekeeping of universities that they worry that for some reason, these conversations are inherently political. Or that's their belief or whatnot. And so exactly as you said, we know that the departmental, at a departmental level, it more than likely won't. We do, I mean, not always, but 
probably it won't happen, which is why I think you, you know, even just your writing on a blog, I mean, we, we can't always, you know, at Fieldwork and Initiative specifically, we can't always get to the departments and have those conversations, um, but they can't stop students from finding your blog, right? And um, this type of thing. And so, yeah, having um, more conversations or having more of a direct relationship, um, even if um, the, the institution is or ac the academy is standing in the way, blocking it, having more kind of direct um, resources for students themselves, I think that's wonderful. If, folks mm -hmm. reach out to you with their own ideas or I think, you know, you're, um, you speak about even writing something. Um, I think having as, as many and as plural options or plural resources to where there are so many, they simply can't avoid encountering something is really wonderful. Um, and this is what we even tell departments like, okay, we want to give our training. We'll even give it for free if it's a budgetary. And if they still say no, we say, okay, but we hope that you'll at least something, something has to be, you know, be done because we know that this is so common so mm -hmm. wonderful um ingrid thank you so much for that kind of open call to action of, of yes, people yes, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah yeah and so we're going to link all of your information below we um as well as the articles that we spoke about today um we also really encourage um people to um go to powerofanthro.com which is ingrid's uh, domain um and please connect with her or just in general her writings um you speak about writing more and also we're w waiting for your book the transition out of um academia manual um this is going to be another uh, manual that we add to our repertoire so um, <laughs> i know how many manuals do we need? Yeah. Well, you're, you're, this is, I love what you said is that you, you know, um, these conversations are had and then they kind of end. And so we need to make it so that it's actual intervention or changing this culture, which we know is toxic and we want to um, kind of have it um, evolve to be um, protecting of students and researchers um, where we, we're aware of the dangers of the field. So I love your, um, your you know idea that you you need to be helpful in anything you do that's very very important mm -hmm. um so thank you again for being here with us for hearing all of your insights um and we look forward to the release of that book in spring 2021 and again um please everyone link down and you can you can um connect with ingrid um go to her um, domain her website read her writings it's very very i mean you talk about underwear you talk about menstruation in the field you talk about in general daily hygiene and and sexual harassment and machismo and national you know national counters about you know this label that's written on your forehead where folks might and when they receive you they this is an idea in their mind and so mm -hmm. it's really really important so thank and you again for being here and relationships too sex and relationships exactly yeah that happens in the field where it, we need mm -hmm. yeah. exactly we need a realistic idea um so right. students are aware of um of of what may happen and what will happen so um thank you for your writing thank you for being here with us and for your um you know your dedication to being helpful to anthropology and, and field work in general it's so needed so um yeah we welcome you again we want folks to reach out to you with that call that you just made and also just yeah. in general to read your writing so ingrid we really appreciate your time thank you for being here with us yeah it was my pleasure Great, excellent. Well, so signing off, thanks everyone for watching um, this uh, fourth installment of Field Stories. Um, and uh, we hope that you um, continue to make connections. So again, reach out to Ingrid and um, we're pushing it one step forward and call to action. And we hope that it, um, in, it, it stimulates everybody to um, start thinking about not just those plans, but in general changes that need to be made. So mm -hmm. thanks again. Thank you. Thanks for having this.